I'm very honored to again welcome Joan Van Houten of the Voice of Innocence Group to the Ultimate Movies broadcast show. Part two of my interview with Joan is a powerful conclusion featuring those personal issues family and friends must deal and learn to live with when wrongful conviction and imprisonment occurred. I wish my very best to her as she continues with her love and support for her stepfather Mike Johnson and also as she looks toward the day he will step out of prison exonerated and a free man after more than two decades. Feel free before or after to refresh your memory of part one of the feature interview, which can be accessed from the Ultimate Movies broadcast show four. And now we pick up in part two, where we'd left off in part one. And then even though today your stepfather is still positive and looking forward, even with all the terrible things that have gone behind, does he or has he expressed any bitterness toward the justice system? I don't see bitterness in him. You know, Mike is an amazing person. He balances his emotions so well. And I'm not saying he, he never gets angry about what happened. That would be inhuman. You, you can't live through this and never be angry that you're there. But he believes that justice will come. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe not at the hands of those who did this to them, but by the hand of God and God's direction and God's ability to touch people and reach out to people. And he believes that there will come a day when one of the key players will open themselves up to the truth and these men will be set free. And he believes that, that there will be one that mm -hmm. will step forward and have the courage to right the wrong that's been done. The faith is there that that day will come. His faith is yeah. so there. I am just, again, astounded. I'm astounded that he is so confident and in a recent letter that I wrote to him, I just, I voiced my frustration that this is what I'm doing, like managing the Voice of Innocence Facebook site. I've learned how to create videos so we can get out there in the video area, arena. I'm writing letters, I'm writing emails. This is what other people are doing. We're gaining more support. I tell him all of this, and, and in all of that, he hears what I'm really saying. Mm -hmm. and, and that is that, I'm trying so hard, and I'm sorry. I'm sorry you're still in there. Yeah. And he wrote back, soothing me and telling me that not to worry mm -hmm. because God's working. Because mm -hmm. He's not worried. Yeah. You know, God is holding the scales, and you and your stepfather are living in such a delicate balance, just waiting for that day to come. You can't know how hard it is to be such a good man where he is, and and wrongfully so. It's there's never enough. You can never do enough. Try to get him out, and you can never talk to him at full. And you can well, you know, in times of great difficulty, my father would always say to me, carry on. You can't do any more than just carry on with what you're doing, especially if in your heart you believe it's right. And, you know, and then, like I say, the day of justice will come. And I was wondering too, Joan, um, and my heart goes out to you right now. I can feel your emotion through the speakerphone here, through the phone line. But we'll carry on here too. Has your stepfather been in touch at all with Cal Monfiles, the brother of Tom Monfiles, whom Cal considers to have committed suicide? No. Has your father commented about Cal Monfiles at all? Or? He is so impressed by Cal Monfiles, so impressed by the courage. Can you imagine going up against your own family and them wanting this just to be gone and over with and resolved, and yet Cal can't seem to do that because to him it's not resolved, it's not over with because the truth isn't there and he's very supportive of our movement and our push for new trials for these men. You know, we're not even saying, hey, swing those doors open and let them walk, but give them a fair shot at a trial because what's going to happen is when they get a new trial, they will walk. When they're able to defend themselves individually instead of being lumped into a group and having to fight a theory without evidence, how do you fight nothing? It's so hard, and, and the jury was so confused. They were so confused. And Cal felt that he was confused. He didn't feel he had any answers, and he said so many times. 
didn't feel like he got the answers. He wasn't told who actually killed his brother. He he wasn't told how his brother actually died. He wasn't he wasn't given any answers at all. It's like hell being the brother. Who knows you better than your brother, let's say, right? So he Exactly. Yeah. Who knows and he immediately recognized the knot as one that he has seen his brother tie. So it's frustrating that even being the brother of Tom Monfiles, even Cal's voice was not important enough mm-hmm. to be heard mm-hmm. by the prosecutor and by the investigating detective. Did your stepfather um, ever speak, though, of, of Tom Monfiles at all in light of uh, sharing any memories of him as a co-worker and a friend? Well, there, there in itself is another whole frustrating part because on the day that Tom Monfiles disappeared, Mike believed he knew who Tom Monfiles was. And he actually, when walking out of the James River paper mill that day, was approached by a reporter who asked him if he would make, you know, if he would answer a couple of questions, and, and he gladly did. And when asked if he knew Tom Monfiles, Mike had actually said right on that interview, oh, yes, he's a nice guy. He's a popcorn man, would bring homegrown popcorn for and share it with everybody. And here it turned out that that was not Tom Monfiles. The popcorn man is a whole different man, and that came out later. Right. And that's why that video, that interview that Mike gave to a, a local news station was never used in trial because mm-hmm. we could have brought in the real man who brought the homegrown popcorn to work, which was would have proven that Mike didn't know Tom Monfiles. He had the name confused with a different person. Right. He really had very very little to say about right. any experiences with Tom Monfiles right. at work because he didn't know who the guy was. Oh, so when um, your stepfather was interviewed by the reporter, he thought they were speaking of a different Tom? He thought he heard the name Tom Monfiles, but he associated the face with a whole different man. Uh-huh. So he thought he knew Tom Monfiles uh, okay. as the popcorn man. But then even speaking of the real Tom Monfiles, where I believe I had read it had come out later that he was uh, going through a depression, suffering from depression. and um, Yes, and many people stated that yeah. that was true, and that he was having marital problems, that right. he was going through, uh, that he was going through and had been through troubles with depression right. um, and was emotionally not very stable at the time. And right. furthermore, he really identified himself with his job at James River. It was very important to him. It, it was his identity. Right. Uh, his father had worked there and he was very proud of that. Yeah. You know, he was working at the same company that his father had worked at. To take that away from him and humiliate him at a place where he identified his whole being, and then having depression added into the mix, the possibility of suicide becomes very real. Depression is like a, a, an illness that's unpredictable. Like, no one can ever say that they think, oh, I think this person may commit suicide or this person may run away or, you know, like it's a, it's an illness that it's like very hard to put it in a box and, you know, put labels on it because I think when people go through depression, they suffer, like you say, different circumstances and you never know what they might do to themselves. Absolutely. Yeah. It, it's an epidemic worldwide. I've even had people say, well, who would kill themselves that way even if they were suicidal? Who would choose to go that way? On the other hand, if you research the many different ways people choose to die, there are far worse ways than drowning in a tissue bath. Yes. And and far more gruesome ways that people have chosen to go. Now, would this type of evidence of the depression on the part of Tom Monfiles be something acceptable uh, as, as evidence in a new trial? Or? Well, that's an issue that's actually being brought up in the appellate, the appeal process that Keith Kuska is in right now that really will cascade down to the other five men. Mm-hmm. And that is the fact that Tom's depression was not fully investigated. His mental state was not fully investigated and put, you know, brought up in court. And the possibility of suicide was completely mm-hmm. ignored of the coroner's findings. Mm-hmm. But people, you know, I ask people to also keep in mind that the coroner's finding is her opinion of the facts. So if she's looking at the coroner's, at the autopsy report, 
her finding is, a, is her opinion of what the report is showing. The state of decomposition and the damage to the body that was caused while being in that vat made it realistically impossible to know what happened right. before his body was. Do you personally know, though, if Tom Monfiles was um, like seeking medical help? Was he under the treatment of a doctor for depression, do you know? I don't believe that he was immediate at, at that point in time. Mm -hmm. Or did he have a history of that he yeah. had been to therapy uh -huh. um, in the past. And I have to say honestly that I, I don't have a lot of direct knowledge of the circumstances. Mm -hmm. Just what his own relatives have said, what co-workers who were closer to him have said, and people who have who had worked with him for years and what they witnessed as far as his emotional state and his, you know, willingness at times to be kind of cruel to yes. people. Well, hopefully with any retrial that they'll uh, try to gather as much evidence in that field as possible as, as related to what he did actually seek help for. So. Yes, I mean, we certainly hope that all of that will come into light and, and then it ends up in the hands of the court again to assess whether the coroner's findings, who had very little experience with this type of death and damage to right. bodies, and then, but like along the lines now, we're looking to the future for a retrial, or, but have there been any developments in the case uh, since we last spoke and our updates about your stepfather's parole request? Well, that will take another, uh, I believe, another seven to nine months where yeah. he'll come back up for parole again. We're certainly not giving up on letting the parole board know what the opinion of the people are. The last event we had was a letter writing campaign mm -hmm. asking people to continue writing to the parole board to let them know that we back the release of all five of these men. Right. So, but to your knowledge, like, is the legal team for, you know, the defense, like, I think Joan Trepp had also mentioned that the same legal team that was in place in the original court trial is still present, are they? At this point, each man has a legal team, however, they are completely different than the original set, and we're probably two sets in from the original, and thank God, they yeah. thank God for that. First of all, it's very, very hard to find um, attorneys who are willing to fight for you pro bono. Yeah. All of these men, you know, our families are out of money. We have nothing left to put in to bring them and getting them through this legal process, which takes, again, years and mm -hmm. years. You're hearing about people finally being exonerated up to 35, 40 years. That's how long this takes, and, and to continue funding that is so hard and mm -hmm. most often impossible unless you're extremely wealthy. So each man has a pro bono attorney and law firm backing them, which is unheard of. You're talking five men, mm -hmm. five, not just one but all sides. So that alone shows you the problems in this case, that we were able to find five different sets of attorneys for each of the months. So that tells you something. It says a lot about what attorneys who view the evidence in this case feel. And um, all the legal teams, they're also continuing to work toward uncovering new evidence that can be submitted to trial? and like yeah, th and That, that search all, is ongoing? They're all of them pushing. And they're Good. all of them searching, and they're all of them um, watching the appeal case for Keith Kuska, which is the one that's in the court system right now, mm -hmm. to see how this unfolds. This part is, you know, it lifts, it lifts your heart knowing that none of the men are without legal counsel at this point. It, it lifts the heart because that was, you would think, an impossible feat, and in large part thanks yeah. to Joan Trepa who is an advocate for wrongly convicted, adopted our case, and has fought so hard for these men, thanks to her that, you know, this all unfolded for each of the men. It's such a huge step from where we were with our Mike. Uh, his original defense attorney, Eric Stern, is actually in prison himself mm -hmm. at this point because in a drunk driving accident, he killed a child. During those court proceedings, we learned that Eric Stern had his whole life suffered from bipolar uh -huh. disorder, chronic depression, alcoholism, and here this man represented my dad. I had no clue right. because we weren't involved in the legal system. 
And some of these illnesses, like we just mentioned before, they don't uh, show forth with the same symptoms. You know, sometimes there there are no symptoms that someone is under depression or bipolar. Like, how is the average person supposed to know? You meet someone, do you know? Exactly. Yeah. And that's yeah. the thing is, uh, you know, how do you investigate the quality or the integrity or the ability of an attorney outside of what already filed in the court system with prior cases? You, mm-hmm. you don't know if he's an alcoholic. There's nothing wrong with being uh, bipolar, but he was not being treated. So here he was, you know, bipolar, chronic depression, alcoholic, who was not being treated while representing our Mike in the biggest case Green Bay has ever seen. Mm-hmm. That mm-hmm. is frightening. And every time I think about him, I get so angry, mm-hmm. so angry. This man even considered mm-hmm taking any case, let alone one so complicated and so politically charged, that he would step in. And it was discovered immediately after the trial that he had been conversing with the district attorney's office for a position they had open during the trial. That's a conflict of interest. Yes, but bringing that up in the court to judge after the fact, the judge didn't feel that that had any bearing on how Eric Stern conducted himself as a defense attorney. Well, at least today, more is known about illnesses like bipolar and depression. And But your father has had to surmount so many of these um, unfortunate, extraneous circumstances in his quest for, I, I don't like to use the term proving his innocence, but to disprove his conviction instead, let's say. But going on to be more positive now, too, has, has your Mike expressed anything in the way of plans or things he has vowed to do if and when he is released? Has he expressed anything like, I'm going to go and do this, I'm going to join this group, I'm going to become an advocate myself for the wrongfully convicted? Or? He for sure wants to continue his spiritual journey. I know that he enjoys reaching out to other inmates in, in prison and teaching them what he's learning about the Word of God and about all the messages contained in, in the Bible. As for definite plans, I think that the first is just enjoying time every day with his family. I also see him very clearly working to be a voice for others who are struggling through what he's been struggling through now. So he's going to try to pick up the threads of his of his life that he had known before, although it's, of course, changed, because the same way he had to adjust to prison life, now he's like going to have to readjust to life on the outside, is it like within a normal family again? And Oh, so much has changed. Yeah. I mean, if you look back the past 20 years, he's going to be, when he walks out, it's going to be like dropping him onto a whole other planet. You know, the use of computers has grown. All of the things involved with the internet, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all the email communications has become such a commonplace thing, we barely think about it anymore. Now, it's cars that park themselves, uh-huh. I mean, oh, yeah. it's, to him, it's going to be a whole different world that he's walking into. It's going to be quite challenging for anyone who's been away, um, locked away these past 10, 20 years. The advancements have yeah. been huge. So he wasn't allowed uh, computer access, internet access, well? Absolutely not. No. So he really tried to stay up on technology, you know. He had subscriptions to popular science and things like that, popular mechanics. He was a huge reader and a big learner, loved to learn new things. So he was constantly reading up on, on new developments and world news. These impressed upon me is that you needed to know what was going on beyond your own little bubble. <laughs> impact what's going on out there and what's going on out there impacts you we're all connected we're all connected that way and and that was i think the the lesson that he taught me that stands out more than all others is that everything you do in your life everything you do in your day daily living impacts someone and everything that they do impacts you and it's important to realize that that everything that we do for our men and reaching out and sharing our story we're we're able to be compassionate and understanding of others who are struggling and who who are in pain and i'm hoping that with each step we take and each message that we share that we're impacting them in a positive way because to me that's 
that's something I do for my dad because right. it's important to him that we make a positive influence in the world around us. And then just thinking, too, again, of how you mentioned that, you know, his his involvement in, uh, he has an understanding of the people who have been wrongfully convicted in there. And when you mentioned that before, with his relationship with God and everything, it sounds like he might fit the bill as maybe being a prison chaplain one day, because he has that empathy and understanding of that situation. I think that they should beg him to do that, because he has such peaceful presence and compassionate presence that he could make a huge difference for a lot of people. And, and not because of the words he speaks, but because of the sincerity in his heart. And, and you can't help but feel that sincerity, that he truly wants good for you, and that he'll stand by you while you're working for that. And I think that he could change many, many lives, and I think he's doing that now. Right, it looks like what God can see as a triumph eventually one day, you know, in, in his life. Yes, and he, you know, he views every day as a triumph as long as God's standing beside him. Mm -hmm. Because it guides him to behave in a way that is respectful to himself, to his maker, and to those around him. Now, even thinking more positively, have you and your family and friends been preparing for his possible release from prison? I don't think that there's a way to prepare, because the, their release is going to be so huge in our lives, and just as their conviction was, there's just no real preparing for that. And I think that the immediate thing is that every man's going to want to be home with their family right. and their children yeah. and their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren in some cases. And I think that that's going to be the first focus, is just to enjoy that moment of unity. And then eventually there may be a big gathering. I would like it. I would like for everyone to come together and celebrate. I hope the media won't turn it into a circus. Oh, well, you know that they will. And you know what? I personally, in, in my opinion, I, I want them to. I want them to because it'll show what these men have yeah. suffered yeah. and what they've lost. And it'll show the world that if you keep fighting and you don't give up on the truth, the truth will not give up on you. And eventually, you'll triumph and you're going to be that energy back into your family, all that energy that was taken from you. Right. Beautifully said. Now, this is almost, I don't want to ask it, but I should. Uh, what might your plans and thoughts be if no release is granted? Did you have any peace about that, or you just continue to work toward a, an exoneration for your stepfather? Yeah, that's not an option. Uh, there's always hope. Uh, even when you feel hopeless, uh, it's just because you can't see it at that moment, but you need to give yourself a breath so you can catch sight of it again. There's always hope. You know, as long as there's good in the world and as, as long as there's good people willing to listen and learn and fight, there's hope. Until every last one of those kind of people is gone, there's hope. And I believe that there are more good people in this world than bad. And I believe that there's more light than dark. So even when I get frustrated and break down in tears and get angry because I can't seem to connect with what is needed at this very moment, if I take a breather and take a step back and, and reach myself, move more inward to concentrate what energy I have left, it, it helps me get through that point and the energy comes back and I can see the hope again. And then you just, well, like your father said, you just keep on keeping on. Yeah, that's right. You carry on. You know, actually, you sort of answered my next question, like, because I was going to ask you, what helpful advice might you have for others who are going through what you have gone through now for over 20 years? What could help them cope better when their family member or friend has been wrongfully convicted and unjustly served a prison term? Uh, you've just sort of said it there. You sort of have to go with the flow and, and meet the challenges as you go along. Or? The opposite side, they win when you quit. As long as you refuse to quit, they can't win. They've won a battle, and a big one at that. But they, they haven't won the war unless you quit. So don't quit. As long as there's one person willing to listen, you keep talking. As long as there's one person willing to learn, you keep sharing. As long as there's one person willing to stand by you, you hold on and you take them along. Don't quit. Great advice, Joan. 
And then with our final question here, um, and we touched on it in the first interview as well, how are you personally continuing to work with the Voice of Innocence and other groups toward reducing and even eliminating incidences of wrongful convictions? Like you have your voice, so what, what is it now that you're making people aware of? Like any case that comes up with wrongful convictions? Well, we, we always invite people to share their cases at every point. Also, we like to keep our eye out on new exonerations that, that come into light. Just within days, there's been a woman in Michigan, in lower Michigan, who has been exonerated for the molestation of her adopted son, or her foster son, I think it was like 10, 15 years ago. And he had come forward and recanted, stating that he was pushed into giving false testimony, false statements against her. So it happened, you know. Um, the truth does come out. So we like to share those stories of exoneration to let people know that there are those who are listening and there are those within the system who are listening, who are paying attention. And it sort of um, encourages the legal system to not quickly advance with a case without ensuring that everything, all the details are correct. Like instead of just rushing something through or overlooking things, it, it forces the legal system to look more closely at exactly at what they're taking to trial. Exactly. Yeah. And, that, you know, the legal system isn't, it isn't perfect. There are so many flaws um, as far as how long it takes for, for the truth to advance within the system, how long it takes for prosecutors to throw in the tell when they're clearly in the wrong. There's so many prosecutors that... Even with strong witness recantations, even with new evidence proving innocence, they continue to fight. And that, that keeps the innocent person in prison. They continue to fight because they don't want to say that they were wrong, that they made a mistake, that they intentionally hid information. They don't want to admit it, so they keep fighting. Mm -hmm. that, that kind of thing has to stop. And you have to enforce that accountability or there will be people who will continue to save themselves by sacrificing the innocent out okay. here. And these are the kind of cases that the voice of innocence is dedicated to bringing to light. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. It, it is accountability. People's yeah. lives are at stake, many, many lives and their families. And this also affects our communities. It affects your pocketbook because we're paying for innocent people to be in prison. So, you know, you look at those who come out, count up the lawsuits. We're talking billions of dollars in lawsuits being paid out to innocent uh, across the country because a prosecutor somewhere decided that their embarrassment is more valuable than the lives of innocent people. This is what it's coming down to. Well, it's good that you're keeping them accountable there, Joan. And I admire, I truly admire your, your dedication to, to this. And also because of your personal connection through your stepfather and with his wrongful conviction. And I truly hope that one day that his conviction will be overturned. He'll be exonerated with the other, there's still four other men as well, right? Well, well, we hope for positive outcomes for all. And so this brings us to the end of our interview, Joan. And I hope you'll keep me updated there in the future. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for helping us to see what really happens to families when their loved ones have unfortunately become victims of the justice system, whether through careless error, negligence, or blind intent. I hope in your stepfather's case, Mike, that his parole will be forthcoming and his exoneration become official sooner rather than later. Many, many thanks, Joan. It has been a true honor and a true pleasure to speak with you once again. Thank you so much, Lorraine, for yeah. having me again, and I absolutely will keep you posted.